a cooling system is necessary to absorb the heat. To control the rate of reaction, rods of cadmium or some such substance must be introduced which can absorb neutrons if lowered into the pile. Now, if the cooling fluid, probably helium gas, were passed through a heat exchanger containing water tubes, the water could be heated up and turned into steam. Most of this part of the installation would have to be screened off by heavy concrete or water shields and operated by remote control. The steam could be used to drive turbo generators to provide electricity in a powerhouse or in a big ship. This adaptation of the atomic pile as a source of heat energy is now being tackled in the United States and Great Britain. The use of radioactive byproducts from the pile is also being investigated. Medical research is now employing new tracer techniques based on radioactive elements. In this test, a radioactive sodium salt is being used to check blood circulation time. The Geiger counter picks up the radioactivity from the sodium. Now the doctor prepares to inject the sodium into a vein in the patient's foot. The radioactivity will be picked up by the counter as the sodium in the blood reaches the patient's groin. The injection is made and the scientist starts his stopwatch. The radio sodium travels up the leg in the blood stream. The counter is shielded from outside radiation by a lead block with a slot beneath. Now, 10 seconds have passed and the counter reveals the arrival of the radio sodium. From such experiments, it is hoped to devise a test to help prevent some of the complications which follow childbirth. Other possible sources of atomic energy are suggested by what is known as the generation of solar and stellar energy. Under conditions of tremendous heat and pressure, complicated nuclear reactions are provoked, resulting in the building up of helium nuclei from hydrogen. In this process, large amounts of energy are released. Perhaps man may one day obtain energy by building up heavier atoms from the lighter ones. Meanwhile, the representatives of the United Nations in conference strive for some formula to banish the atomic bomb and to permit the blessings of atomic energy to be used for peaceful ends. Great Britain's research establishment at Howell is under the direction of Dr. Cockcroft. You have seen the story of a remarkable scientific achievement based on the work of scientists of many nations, but owing most of all to the work of Rutherford and the School of Nuclear Physics which he developed. The final achievement of the release of nuclear energy for war was due largely to the scientists and engineers of the United States, stimulated and helped by British physics. We have now the task of using the immense power of nuclear energy for peaceful purposes, for the production of radioactive materials, for medical and biological research, and for the generation of heat and power. With our present knowledge, it is possible to design nuclear power stations which will produce power at a moderate efficiency. Until we acquire operating experience of these plants, we do not know how economical they will be, nor are we sure of overcoming all the technical difficulties which will occur in a large-scale development of nuclear power. Nevertheless, there is a real promise that over the next few decades, world power resources can be greatly increased, and that the very great benefits to be obtained will do much to increase standards of living. It is the hope of every scientist that nuclear energy will lead to the establishment of a world organization for the effective control of all weapons of mass destruction, and through this, to the abolition of war. From Dalton's theory to atomic power. It is a long road, but the landmarks are clear. With the atomic theory as a basis, a pretty complete picture of the elements of our material world was fitted together during the 19th century the discovery of electrons, the realization of the nature of positive rays, the strange powers of X-rays revolutionized conception of the nature of matter and of the atom itself. The study of radioactivity, first investigated by Becquerel and then by the Curies, led Lord Rutherford to make the greatest single advance in atomic theory. He pictured a small heavy nucleus in the atom round which the electrons revolved. 
In 1919, Rutherford discovered how to change one element to another by bombardment with alpha particles. He suggested that the nucleus of the atom might contain protons and uncharged particles of about the same mass. In 1932, scientists could say with certainty that the atom contained electrons carrying unit negative charges and a nucleus built up of protons carrying unit positive charges and of neutrons, uncharged particles equal in mass to protons, whose existence was proved by Sir James Chadwick. In 1932 also, Cockcroft and Walton split the lithium atom by bombardment with protons and found that mass could actually be translated into energy in perfect accord with Einstein's theory. Atomic disintegrations provoked by great machines became a commonplace of well-equipped physics laboratories. In 1939, uranium fission was first noted. The possibility of a self-sustaining chain reaction suggested the wholesale release of energy. Controlled chain reactions were achieved in the atomic pile. The imagination of the world has been stirred by the prospect of adapting such piles to use as sources of heat energy and as sources of radioactive materials for use in medicine. In research laboratories, the scientists are even now writing fresh pages in this unfinished story. But overall, the smoke of the atomic bomb hangs like a pall. If we are to reach the future that promises so bravely, the peoples of the world must see that this new power is wisely used.